Would you please make very welcome for lecture number two, the final lecture of the International Science School, Matthew Hole. Well, thanks again. So what I want to talk about now is a bit about uh, some fusion science, in particular some basic science of fusion, which is plasma physics, and talk a little bit about some of the Australian activity and perhaps uh, where we might go in, into the future. So the first thing to note is that Australia's actually had an involvement in this field of research for a long time, going right back to Sir Mark Oliphant in, in 1932. But the University of Sydney in particular has had a strong activity in this space. Uh, in fact, one of the early pioneers, Peter Toman, was from the University of Sydney, and he largely established much of the UK uh, Atomic Energy Authority's program, uh, initially at Harwell and now at Cullum. Uh, in the early post-war period, uh, so Mark Oliphant commenced plasma physics at ANU. The ANU also had the first tokamak outside of Russia, which was completely coincidental because it wasn't intended to work that way. But uh, it was intended to be a slow pinch experiment, but uh, it <laughs> ended up having a significant current inside it and uh, uh, was indeed the first tokamak in the West. An Australian discovered alphane gaps that I'm going to talk about. An Australian invented the rotamac. Uh, the University of Sydney had its own uh, uh, tokamak for about uh, 20 years or so uh, that was pioneered by Professor Rod Cross. And uh, more recently, there's been a, a focus on stellarated configurations at the ANU, uh, together with some first demonstration of a spherical tokamak at ANSTO. So the point of this really, this is a bit, um, uh, what's the word, nationalistic in some sense. That's probably the wrong word. What I'm trying to indicate is that Australia has actually worked in this space for some time. What I want to go on to now is talk about um, some different magnetic confinement concepts. So, so far I've been talking largely about the tokamak concept. Uh, I mentioned to begin with that if you have a, a uniform magnetic field in a room and apply uh, a strong magnetic field, particles gyrate around those field lines, I can do something more complicated than a uniform magnetic field. I can apply a focused magnetic field, and the value of that is that if you focus the magnetic field, at least in this experiment, it's possible to, that's interesting, Oh, there's the laser pointer. It's possible to focus a, a plasma down to a target and do um, material studies on a surface substrate. I can introduce from a linear machine, I can deliberately introduce a field ripple, and this is done on a machine in the US called the, not called the Los Angeles Police Department, it's called, <laughs> called the Los Angeles uh, Plasma Device. Uh, and the idea of this is that by introducing this field ripple, you can start introducing uh, some of the concepts of magnetic curvature uh, to a linear machine, uh, right through to a tokamak that I've already talked about. So I want to go left of field a little bit and talk about two things in particular, a spherical tokamak. So, so far the tokamak that I've been talking about is a donut. And a spherical tokamak is a bit more like a cord apple in its configuration. So here's some experiments in the UK and the US. Uh, which are spherical tokamaks, and the idea of the spherical tokamak is that it has a smaller aspect ratio, so this aspect ratio of this major to minor radius is smaller. Because it's smaller and the field strength goes as one of R, the smaller R means that you get bigger field for the same pressure, or conversely, for the same pressure you can do it at lower field strength. It has higher performance, uh, a better stability, but uh, as I said before, you have to drive this, you have to drive uh, a changing magnetic field through the configuration to induce a current. And the consequence of this is that there's much less space in this central solenoid, in this gap, to be able to drive that current. And experimentally, what that means is that it's much easier to blow up the central solenoid. So when I say blow up, for it to arc. Unfortunately, that's happened with, the, with this experiment at least once. Uh, so that means it's less suitable in some sense to a power plant, but it has a attractive features of stability. All tokamaks, however, have, a large, have to have a large current uh, to create this polluter confining field. And this is a source of free energy that can drive the plasma unstable. So an alternative concept to that is known as the stellarator. So in, the, in a tokamak, this field line helicity that I talked about, this magnetic field pitch, is driven by an internal plasma current. In a stellarator, you achieve the same outcome by a twist of the whole machine. You twist the machine or you twist the conductors. 
And the, here's a, a cross-section of the ANU experiment, the H1 uh, experiment at uh, uh, the major national research facility. And here's an inset of the plasma cross-section. And you can see that by displacing the coils and adding this helical winding current around it, you've been able to introduce a deliberate twist to the magnetic field. So as the, magnetic, as the particle rotates around the tokamak, it sees the entire uh, poloidal cross-section. I don't need a current in order to be able to to drive that field twist. Whilst this eliminates the disruptive current driven instabilities, the field coils are an engineering challenge. So in a tokamak, this field coil is a flat coil, it's a pancake coil. So if I lay it on the floor, it'll lie on the floor exactly. But uh, in a accelerator, that's not true. So the field coils become a real engineering headache. So here's a field coil that was installed in W7X which is a machine that's just been recently brought online in Germany. So I was there a couple of weeks ago. And this is very exciting because this is a $1 billion experiment which is coming online now. Uh, ETA will come online maybe in, uh, well, <laughs> time scales are difficult to predict, maybe eight years, that's the hope. Uh, but Wendelstein 7X is coming on now, online now and the idea of this is to evaluate the main components of a future power reactor built upon this different uh, confinement technology. Uh, just last week, uh, there was a, a full test of its toroidal field coils at nearly 13 kiloamps with a machine cooled down to 4 Kelvin and are producing three Tesla on axis. And here's a, uh, results of an electron beam uh, which propagates throughout the plasma and it's tracing field lines throughout it. So this is really the very first uh, plasma experiment, if you like, that has been conducted on Wendelstein 7X. And that's really very exciting for the Germans. They, they hope Chancellor Merkel will open this facility uh, sometime soon, once she's finished dealing with the Greek financial crisis. I mentioned plasma physics. I, t I haven't really given you much in depth so far about the underlying science of plasma physics, and I want to try and do that a little bit now. But the first thing to note is that physics regimes and physics models span a wide range of plasma densities and electron temperature. So they span from the interstellar gas, which is relatively cold and diffuse, uh, through to fusion experiments and fusion reactors, which are at high electron temperature, as we've seen, and also high plasma density. And in between, there's a range of things uh, going through, through to gas discharges, which is where most of the semiconductor uh, technology processing uh, is based on plasma physics or based on plasma discharges uh, through to the solar corona at higher temperature but lower density. And there are a wide range of different physics models that one can use to describe these plasmas. So a standard approach to use this is called the dielectric tensor. So what the dielectric tensor is, is forget that word for a minute, who's heard of Maxwell's equations? Great, most <laughs> of you have heard of Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations have uh, a, a, an effective um, permittivity in, in the um, electric field strength. So in the dielectric tensor, what you do is that effective permittivity captures the entire response of the plasma. And this works well if the plasma is cold, and it works well if the plasma is both unmagnetized and magnetized. If, however, you go to higher temperatures, uh, and particularly if there's flow, uh, a different uh, prescription is often used, which is called... Uh, magnetohydrodynamics. So you would have heard of hydrodynamics, uh, which is fluid dynamics. Magnetohydrodynamics is what happens when you add Maxwell's equations to hydrodynamics. And in that case, you have a flowing plasma with a simple single temperature for ions and electrons. You could use a gyrokinetic simulation. So who's heard of distribution functions for gases? Sort of half the class. So if I look at the gas in this room um, <coughs> and try and look at uh, a distribution function of the population of that gas, what I mean is what is the number of particles in the room that have a certain velocity. So if I look at the mean velocity of that, the, the doors are shut, so there's no gust of door, there's no gust of wind in the room, so the mean velocity of that distribution function is zero. But its width is not zero, because its width is the characteristic speed at which individual particles are moving. And they're moving all over the place. The reason why they're moving all over the place is because that gives rise to, an effect, that gives rise to temperature. 
So if you ask the question, what is temperature? Temperature is uh, random movement of particles in velocity space in different directions, which give rise to uh, an effective temperature that you feel. So you can treat a plasma gyrokinetically and simulate the whole particle distribution function with or without a magnetic field. The final thing that you can do is particle and cell simulation where you track every single particle movement in the room. Now let's ask the question, for ETA, the particle density is like 10 to the 20, so I would need to track 10 to the 20 particles in the entire experiment within one cubic volume meter uh, as a function of time. Now, computers just can't do that. Computers are very powerful, but you might be able to uh, simulate that for maybe one millisecond, and that might take six months to do it. So it's not numerically possible to do particle and cell simulation uh, across the entire experiment. Uh, the, uh, the, the, con the consequence is that one often uses reduced models, like MHD or the dielectric tensor, and that turns out to be good enough to give you much of the physics. So I'll get to your question in a sec. The other comment to make is that uh, these approximations tend to work better as the field strength is decreasing. Question. So I mean, I mean, I mean an individual atom. I mean an atom or an electron. That's what I mean. Yes, you can. I mean, the, the comment is, is that I don't need to go to quantum mechanics to describe the collective behavior of a plasma. So quantum mecha mechanics um, is necessary if I want to describe uh, interatomic uh, behavior or more intraatomic, so within the, uh, within the atom. But if I want to behave, if I were to understand how a particle responds, it responds according to, to Maxwell's equations as far as the plasma is concerned. So I don't need, there aren't any quantum effects. You, you can have, if you have an extremely high field and extremely high density, you might start talking about a quantum plasma, and there are people in astrophysics who, 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 talk, who uh, develop such theories, but for all of the scales that I've talked about here, uh, across those entire set of scales, I don't need to go to quantum effects. Uh, the entire field, if you like, determined by uh, Maxwell's equations. When I say determined by, the difficulty is, is that I have so many particles in the system that it becomes a complex science challenge in the sense of how do I des describe that collective phenomenon. So an example of a classical piece of physics for which there is no resolution is turbulence. So why is a medium turbulent? That has never been solved despite hundreds of years of research. Uh, so just because the field, what I'm trying to indicate is that uh, there are unsolved questions in classical physics that are at least as hard as quantum physics, and if not harder. But in this particular case, I don't need to invoke quantum mechanics to describe uh, the behavior of the plasma. Classical physics is good enough. It, it, need, it, it could be relativistic, and that's still classical physics. Uh, but um, the, the complexity of the plasma is its sheer number of particles and the complexity of the field. So what I, I, wanna, what I want to talk about is magnetohydrodynamics. So Chris mentioned to me that you got a bit shocked when I started when a previous uh, person put up equations. I'm hoping you can at least follow this because it's not particularly difficult, but I wanted to give you at least a flavor of one approach that is used to model a plasma. So in magnetohydrodynamics, you have uh, uh, particle velocity, which is the ion velocity and the electron velocity. You have an ion density and electron density, and you have uh, an effective charge, or you have a, the, the ionization charge state of the ions. And if you just sum that charge balance together, you'll get a current density. So this, this is a current density of the system. That's nothing else other than what it is. I have, it's a single conducting fluid, and the fluid has a mass velocity V, which is basically the iron mass, or the, the iron velocity, because it's, it's um, weighted according to the mass of the iron. If I add a continuity equation, which is, this tells me the number of uh, particles can, uh, entering a volume is equal to the number of particles that are leaving the volume. That's exactly what it is. It's a continuity equation. And I add to that together with a momentum equation. So you would have seen momentum equations at some point, yes? I can see most people nodding. This is a momentum equation for a particle which has or a fluid element that has mass density m, uh, velocity v, it has a pressure gradient on it, 
which is grad P, and it has a Lorentz force. So if I chuck away this right-hand side, the J cross B bit, you would have seen that before. I'm hoping you would have seen a variant of that before, because that's basically saying uh, that MA equals minus grad P, which is basically a, a pressure gradient equaling a force. So if I now look at my force balance inside a cylinder and look at the components of the force, let's suppose I've got a magnetic field like that and I've got a pressure gradient such that the uh, pressure is maximum in the centre and minimal at the outside, then there's a pressure gradient which is going to act on uh, minus grad P is going to act in this direction. If I put in a magnetic field which is in this direction and there's a current flowing around the machine, then I have a J cross B force, and if I, get the, if I want to get the direction of a force, I use my right-hand rule again. So that's going to produce a force which is in this J cross B direction. And then finally, if there's a flow, like for example an azimuthal flow in this direction, uh, azimuthal flow, a flow in that direction, it's going to produce a rho de V to T term over here. And if I do a force balance calculation, I, would, I, would, I should find, I must find indeed, that J cross B uh, minus grad P equals uh, minus rho to V to T. Question? The upside down delta sign. So the upside down delta sign is a gradient operator. So I don't know whether you've seen a gradient operator before. Who has seen a gradient operator? One person. So unfortunately I don't have a pen in this and this is where I may, I'm hoping I haven't uh, overstepped <laughs> my understanding of your level, but a, a gradient operator, let's suppose I do this in one dimension. In one dimension, a gradient operator is just partial, partial x. So if I look at a gradient going down a hill, the, the gradient operator is, is literally just partial, partial x. If I go into, uh, if I have uh, x and y directions, then the gradient operator will have components that act in the different directions. So this is literally just a gradient operator. Think of it as entirely just that. The J cross B is a right-hand rule thing where I use vector calculus. So who knows vector calculus and J cross B and how to do A cross B with vectors and so forth. So I can see half the class. So if I have a vector in one particular direction, uh, in this case a current, and I have the currents going in that direction and the field is in that direction, if I want to work out the force that's exerted by the plasma, I do a right-hand rule J cross B and it tells me there's a force going towards the ceiling. That's how I compute the direction of a force. So this is doing nothing else other than computing force balance inside the plasma. The reason why this is important is because if I want to describe the collective behavior of the plasma, I need to put, I need to be able to describe it either as a fluid, a particle, or a distribution function. I'm describing it here as a fluid, and I'm telling you how, you, how we go about modeling it. What's often the case, at least certainly in fusion plasmas, is that you throw away the flow piece and you end up with this fourth balance condition, J cross B equals grad P. There's some other stuff that you add to this as well, a generalized Ohm's law. So if I chuck out the V cross B bit and I ask, what's Ohm's law, who could tell me? B equals IR. Well, there you go. Uh, there's the electric field, which is minus the gradient of the potential. Uh, IR, well, there's, there's your I. It happens to be J because it's integrated across a volume, and this thing is a um, uh, this thing is a resistivity. Uh, uh, let me see. It, it is a resistivity component. So that that literally is. If I throw away the V cross B piece, it is uh, Ohm's law uh, plus an equation of state that describes how the pressure relates to the density. So that's MHD. What I want to do now is. Um, describe a slightly different configuration, uh, which is this magnetic field configuration, the linear machine, and I want to understand, uh, what I want to be able to understand is if I have this electron density profile as a function of position, what type of wave field would I expect inside the machine? So what I can do is I can use, uh, that was the MHD model, now I can go to the cold dielectric tensor model and I can add an external uh, antenna in this dielectric tensor formulation and solve for the wave fields. So the only thing that I really want you to take away from this is that these points here are the experimental data and these calculations here are for the wave fields 
with a different fudge factor, if you like, applied to a collisionality term. So sometimes, often in plasma physics or in physics, for example, you may not know entirely how to model something accurately. So what you can do sometimes is you can put in an enhancement factor to some resistivity or collisionality term, which if you modify, uh, gives you an exact match to the data. The question is, well, okay, now I've introduced this knob that I've twisted to get an agreement. Why have I introduced that knob? What's it due to? Well, in this case, uh, it's believed to be due to ion acoustic turbulence. You'll have to bear with me to see where this is going. I'll get back to fusion in just a moment. If I introduce a field modulation to this, Forget about the fact, this looks like a complicated equation, forget about that. Who knows about wave modes? Who knows about wave equations? So this is nothing more than a wave equation for this complicated configuration. I don't care about that. It's a, it's a second order differential equation, but who cares? It's just the important point is to say this is what the wave equation looks like in that geometry. That's all that I want to take away from this. I don't even, I don't even need you to, to understand what all the different pieces are, except from this is a radial operator, uh, and that's the, the azimuthal component of the field. And the point is that if I solve this for the configuration, I get a dispersion relation. So who knows what a dispersion relation is? Not many people will know what a dispersion relation is, I guess. So a dispersion relation tells me how a wave propagates, or how its wave frequency changes with wave number. So what do I mean by that? So if a wave propagates in free space, it will have both a frequency and a wavelength. The frequency uh, is going to be the frequency of light, and in, in for a, uh, a wave propagating in free space, the dispersion relation omega on k just gives me a phase velocity. So as you might know in physics, or you might know, that, uh, that a light wave will propagate a, at literally the speed of light. So if you do omega on k, that is the simple dispersion relation for a wave propagating in free space. This is slightly more complicated, but nonetheless it, it captures the same type of physics sentiment. And what I'm trying to get at really here is that what I'm interested in is this family of modes that exist inside this machine. What I now do is I deliberately introduce a variation in the field strength. So if I deliberately introduce that, then I can model how this dispersion relation changes. And the consequence of doing that is that if I go down, um, if I look at this, which is a, 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 a plot of wave field intensity as a function of frequency, if I look at the case for which the field is uniform, which is the case before I did this, uh, if I propagate a wave mode at a particular frequency, it will always propagate. There isn't a forbidden frequency, if you like, for which the, the signal will not propagate. But if I introduce this modulation, there are gaps that open in this frequency spectrum and the wave will not propagate. I can see you, you being lost, but I want to come back and put this in a different... I, I'm going to come back in a moment and go back over this in a bit more detail because I want you to get this idea. If I introduce a defect into this periodicity, like a conducting end plate, then I can put gap modes back into the plasma. So the first thing to note is that I had, first of all, a continuum of modes. I introduced this periodicity in the wave field. That introduced this gap where some frequencies don't propagate. And then I deliberately broke the periodicity again. And when I deliberately broke this periodicity, these individual wave modes could be excited inside the plasma. There's an analogy here to a standard optical fiber. So if I have an optical fiber and I modulate the refractive index in, of the fiber as a function of position, what will happen is that you won't be able to transmit all the signal across as a function of frequency with the same transmission coefficient. You'll end up with what's known as a Bragg gap where the transmission coefficient drops at a particular frequency and the center of that frequency is known as the Bragg frequency. This is well known in optical telecommunications. The same thing is happening in my periodic machine. I have a periodic machine where I've now introduced a field uh, 
uh, I've introduced this periodicity to the field which has produced this Bragg gap. And the point was, was that if I broke that, if I broke that um, continuum, let me go back again to the previous slide. The point was, was that if I, I broke uh, that periodicity by putting this conducting end plate, a, a mode appeared that was localized. So these gap, I talked about gap modes in a cylinder, and I did that because it was, I hope, easier to understand, and it is easier to understand, than what happens when you start going to a tokamak or a stellarator. What I'm trying to get out of this is that a tokamak and a stellarator are complicated three-dimensional objects and three-dimensional magnetic bottles which can support a whole bunch of wave modes. In the same way that you can get wave modes out of a box, you can get wave modes out of a complicated 3D device. I'll get to your question in a sec. So what this shows is as a function of frequency and radial coordinate, this uh, dispersion relation, if you like, uh, showing where frequency modes can exist inside the machine. And these lines here are these continuum modes which uh, exist inside the, in the machine, which are very spiky things. But away from those, in these gaps, you can hi find these alphanic eigenmodes that have much broader structure. And the point of this is that these modes, which have much bigger structure, when they're driven to large amplitude, uh, can, can expel particles from the confinement system. I realize there's lots of questions here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to at least the next slide, and then I'm going to come back. Come back. This is even more complicated in a stellarator configuration for which I have lots of modes inside the system. Okay, you, you say, well, Matthew's been talking about all these wave modes. I really don't have, have the foggiest of what he's talking about. But I want to say, what is the impact of this? So what I'm really trying to understand is if I have a plasma with a toroidal magnetic confinement device, I've said that I can support a whole bunch of wave modes in it. Why do I care? Well, you know that you can drive... Uh, there is such a thing known as wave particle resonance. This is much easier to understand if you go to the beach. If you go to the beach, you can see that a surfer can catch the wave. That's wave particle resonance. The surfer is the particle, in this case, who's resonant with the wave. And in this case, the, the surfer is driving, is taking power from the wave. A boat could drive a wave by the same token. So if I now go back to fusion, what I mentioned was, was that these alphas that are come out of the plasma at 3.5 MeV, they slow down. They, if, you look at, if you go to the other extreme, the thermal population, like the gas in this room, this is a distribution function, would look like this. Its mean velocity is zero because there's no flow in the room. Its width is a function of, its width indicates the temperature. When I inject particles at 3.5 MeV, they collide. They collide with other particles and they slow down. But when they slow down, they heat the plasma. That's the whole point of why I am able to get some form of self-heating. This neutral beam injection, which is this billiard ball physics I said before, also injects particles, but at a much lower velocity. They also slow down as they collide with the plasma. As the particles slow down, they can hit these resonances. So as the particle slows down, it can hit, be in resonance with the mode. And the point of that is, well, why do I care? Is because at large amplitude, these alpha and eigenmodes can eject, eject the particles from confinement. And if they eject the particle, uh, con particles from confinement, they do several things. First of all, there's still a lot of energy. They can slam into the wall and damage the wall. The second point is, which is perhaps more importantly, is that they've just killed the, the, the heating mechanism of the plasma. If they've been ejected from the plasma, I was relying on this to heat the plasma. But it's just been thrown out of the plasma. So I've extinguished the heating mechanism. This is a piece of physics that's important for a machine like ITER, which is, the, uh, which is what is the impact of these thermonuclear ringtones in a burning plasma environment. Let me go back for a second and go back to how does this fit to this diagram that I talked about just a moment ago. So what I was trying to say is that each of these modes that exist here are at a particular frequency and each of those modes there 
look like a very spiky eigenfunction. So the eigenfunction is like a, a wave mode a structure. It's very radially spiked. These big things over here look like a global wave. They look like a wave that you would see in the ocean. And it's these modes here that can expel particles. So what I'm interested in is how do these, how do these modes eject particles from confinement? And that's what I was trying to make the analogy here to um, a boat and a, a wave surfer being dumped. So I realized that I've introduced quite a few concepts in the last five to ten minutes or so, and I'm going to stop for a moment and turn the floor to you, because I want to see how much of it you got. <laughs> I can see smiles around the audience. Yeah, please. So, what do I mean by a mode? So if I have, that's a very good question. Let's suppose I have a box, a me metallic box. And I try and excite an electric field inside the box. What has to happen is the electric field at the ends of the box have, has to be zero. And that's because I can't have, it has to meet the boundary conditions of the box. I can't drive a potential difference across a box which is made of metal because it's a perfect conductor. So the consequence is that if I want to drive certain wave modes, certain, certain electromagnetic fields inside a box, there's only certain types of wave mo waves that will fit inside the box. And that's known as a wave mode. It has to satisfy the boundary conditions, otherwise it won't be excited inside the box. So what's happening in all of these things is that I have modes, waves, that fit inside the box. So in this case, the box is my toroidal magnetic confinement device. And there are only certain types of waves that fit inside the box. That fit because they're periodic in the long direction. They might be periodic in the short direction around the box. But only certain types of, mo uh, certain types of waves will fit. And that's what I mean by wave modes. And this picture that I was talking about over here tells me the type of wave modes that can exist. So here it's telling me, for example, this is a, a, a picture of some n equal 3 resonant singular frequency. n equals 3 means that in the toroidal direction, the wave has three oscillations. Uh, this is a picture showing its radial structure. And it's telling me it's localized to that surface over here. But if I look at a mode over here, it is big and broad. This, this, this width corresponds to its radial width. So what I'm indicating here is that it's, it's a mode that has a certain radial width and it has uh, a wave function that is sufficiently is periodic that fits inside the box. So I'm talking about waves that will ex exist inside the box. And what I'm trying to say is that if I drive these waves to sufficiently high amplitude, in the same way that a surfer catches a wave, uh, the wave can eject the particle from confinement. That, that's the analogy that I'm trying to draw. Question? Does the confinement only mean magnetic fields or...? So the plasma is comprised of a whole bunch of particles. And what I'm talking about here is particle ejection. So I'm talking about wave particle resonance. So in the case of the ocean, for example, when the surfer catches the wave, the wave becomes very large, it eventually crashes. But the thing that's important is the surfer gets dumped. So the surfer gets dumped and they lose resonance with the wave. They get thrown out of resonance with the wave and the head gets slammed into the sand and in worst case scenario they end up dead. But the point in a, in a particle confinement system is that if the particle loses resonance with the wave, the impact of a wave at very large amplitude, the analogy, other than the surface head being dumped into the ground, is that their particle orbit will be perturbed enormously, and their particle orbit will be perturbed so much that it will get ejected outside the machine. And once it gets ejected outside of the machine, then I have a problem. Because as soon as that happens, then I've lost my heating mechanism to the thermal bolt population. I've lost this heating mechanism. Plus, it also damages the wall. 
So what I'm trying to get here is a sense of um, a combination of what physics models that I might use and also an active piece of research. I'm trying to, trying to bridge some understanding that I have uh, and communicate it to you to give you an idea of what is it uh, that is currently a, a concern for burning plasma physics in a machine like ETA. So in, in that instance, um, of a research field in ETA is trying to understand what do these wave modes do to the plasma, what is their impact on confinement. Another topic I wanted to talk about, so that's energetic particle physics. I also wanted to talk about, just really briefly, uh, what happens to three-dimensional structure. So I said that for a tokamak, it's, it's perfectly uh, toroidally symmetric, so it's the same all the way around the device. But if I look at a device like a stellarator, in which there's this deliberate bumpiness around the machine, uh, then I have a more complicated problem to solve. So let's look at the, the simplest way to solve the field in such a configuration. So the simplest way you'd solve for the field is that you, you'd use this magnetohydrodynamics model that I talked about, which said that grad P equals J cross B. If I assume toroidal symmetry, which I mentioned earlier, then if I follow the field line around, the field line will always puncture one of these circles the dashed lines, not the, not the solid, heavy solid lines. And so that means that's important because what I wanted was I wanted to try and maximize the number of toroidal flux surfaces so as to maximize the pressure inside the machine. But in a stellarator, that's not true. And in general, if I have 3D, a fully 3D configuration, it's not true. What will happen is that there will be some surfaces that still exist i.e. some regions of the, if I follow the field line around, it will still lie on a flux surface, but the field could also form these magnetic island chains. So if I follow the field line, it doesn't necessarily need to lie on a single surface. It could go follow this surface, for example, and go from the inboard to the outboard side. And there are some regions where if I follow the field line, it doesn't even ever lie on a flux surface. It goes through a chaotic region of phase space. So it, it's chaotic. What happens if I follow the field line is that it spans every single point in this volume. And the point of this is that this normally, from a confinement point of view from fusion, is bad. And the reason why it's bad is because, remember, I wanted to maximize the number of those flux surfaces because across each flux surface I could support a pressure jump. But in 3D, I can't necessarily do that unless I design the system ab initio to have a maximal number of surfaces, and this comes into stellarator design. So some existing surface, uh, some existing codes assume these nested flux surface configurations so as to optimize the field. There is a piece of research that I'm involved with at the moment which is trying to understand how you reconstruct those fields within a, a, three a fully three-dimensional plasma configuration. And this used this multi multiple relaxed region MHD model uh, that has been developed at the ANU. So I'm trying to give you a flavour. What I've tried to do so far is give you a flavour of some of the research that I do in a theory and modelling space and trying to communicate uh, that research to you in language that I'm hoping you understand. Let me turn now to some experimental science that's also done at the ANU. So the ANU also hosts this Australian Plasma Fusion Research Facility which is this Heliac Stellarator that I mentioned. So this mission is to study physics of hot plasma in a helical container, look at advanced plasma measurement systems, particularly plasma diagnostics, and to maintain an Australian experimental activity in fusion. There's also this magnetized plasma interaction experiment that I just talked about. So if I look at this machine, this machine is small relative to a machine scale on ETA or even Bendelstein 7X. But nonetheless, you are able to do some interesting basic plasma physics and you're able to do some diagnostic development. So as I said, it's a three-fold symmetry device with a field now less than 0.5 tesla. It's not a superconducting machine, so superconducting meant field strength of 5 tesla or so. This is a copper machine with a field strength of 0.5 tesla with, a com with normally uh, a heating source which is radio frequency. It doesn't have neutral beam injection. The electron temperature is much cooler. We're not talking KeV, we're talking tens of EV. And the density is not 10 to the 19 or 10 to the 20. It's like a hundredth of that. But it, it nonetheless does enable you to do some interesting physics. 
Here's what it looks like. Um, uh, the machine itself, a person would come up to around about there or so. This is a bunch of stairs, so you can see an idea of scale. And here's some research activity that was done on this. So I, these things will just be words to you, but what I'm trying to, what I want to indicate is that, is I'm trying to indicate a breadth of research. So the breadth of research in this machine is done partly by uh, imaging diagnostics, which looks at uh, radio frequency wave fields that are excited in this machine. So this is looking at an optical camera of uh, field line emission inside the machine. Plus it looks at uh, the radial structure and the existence of these wave modes in a complicated 3D configuration. The rest of this is probably just words, as far as you're concerned. There's also this linear device, which I said was looking at material surface interaction, uh, in this case, the idea of it is to try and look at uh, the impact of uh, a magnetized, relatively cold, but high density plasma on a surface substrate and see whether, and look at uh, uh, the growth of helium bubbles in a tungsten steel. So it's looking at materials damage. Uh, and there have been studies that have uh, commenced on that topic. I mentioned wave modes in particular because that's uh, a significant research activity in terms of experimental measurement on the device and also its diagnostic and theory interpretation. So here's looking at the intensity profile of uh, line emission from the plasma and you're reconstructing the wave fields inside the plasma from a line cord of emission. So the important point here is, is that uh, I have a bunch of channels over here that measure uh, the wave, uh, that measure the mode brightness as a function of chord number or the, the channel that I can see across the interferometer and I can invert that to try and find what radial structure of an eigenmode exists inside the plasma. It's a bit like tomography. If I, if I run a, a CAT scan on it, the idea is, is that I have a bunch of chords that are both in one direction and another direction uh, when I look at the, if I do that tomography and do an able inversion, what I'm able to do is reconstruct what the profile of the internal structure of that object. So it's the same tomography technique that would, you, you would use in medicine, but it's applied to an interferometer channel data from a, a, um, a, 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 from a, a, a stellar radar. The other aspect that's done is some surface interaction physics. Uh, which is looking at uh, really material, how the material interacts with the surface uh, in terms of ionization and charge exchange recombination at the surface. Uh, and there's a lot of plasma chemistry uh, which is involved with this. And I don't want to go through the, the goals of that activity in detail. That's some of the work that's done at the ANU. There's also a broader activity, both at the University of Sydney uh, and ANSTO. ANSTO has a growing nu nuclear materials research activity which is more interested in uh, materials for both next generation fission and fusion. There's an activity at the University of Newcastle which looks at high heat flux alloys. Um, Macquarie University has an activity in plasma spectroscopy. One thing I haven't talked about at all is remember I showed that picture of collision cross section for dt as a function of temperature. So that's a well-known cross-section reaction. But if I were to look at uh, the collision physics for both the neutral beam itself, how the, what is the collision cross-section of the neutral beam interacting with uh, a neutral gas, I need to do atomic physics to work that out. And so there are some colleagues at the University of Curtin in Western Australia who work on that. And more recently, there's an activity at the University of Wollongong that does high temperature superconducting technology in this space. Much of my research, all of my research, and much of the research in Australia is heavily internationally engaged. There is no point doing fusion in Australia unless it's internationally embedded, because the whole field is determined by the um, international research program of ITER. So in the last few minutes, what I want to talk about is where is at least Australian fusion science going, because I was asked that over lunch and I thought it might be an interesting thing to discuss. So we put together a strategy which tries to indicate uh, where Australia, how and where Australia might be able to engage with EDA. Uh, 
And what we proposed was a national fusion program that would provide a fellowship scheme, funding for an Australian flagship machine contribution to ITER, provide some ongoing infrastructure support for the fusion facility at the ANU, and supply, and in particular, support engagement through the ITER research program through what's called this International Tokamak Physics Activity. This just looks like words to you, and it is just words to you, but there is a research consortium that looks at ITER physics and is, driv and is driven by and owned by the ITER organisation. And that research consortium is the appropriate body in which most of the major partners discuss strategic uh, program-driven science. And that's the, that's the organisation through which we believe uh, that it would be appropriate for Australia to have such an engagement, and indeed ANSTO has opened that discussion uh, with ITER. There's a machine contribution that we might be able to do, which is perhaps based on uh, Doppler coherence imaging that a colleague at the a at ANU, Professor John Howard, uh, is, an, is a world expert in. And there's a possibility that uh, we, may, we may, may be able to develop a machine contribution to ITER. So what I, I've hoped to have done, I, I've talked a lot more about plasma physics and science in this talk. And maybe I've expanded, maybe I've challenged you perhaps too much without the appropriate background uh, in terms of scope. But what I've hoped to have done is at least given you an idea of what are the, some of the research tools that I use to model a plasma and some of the things that I do at the ANU and the reason why it's programmatically important. I've also talked a little bit about um, Australian fusion R&D. And in the previous lecture, I talked about the time frame for realisation for ITER from power to the grid on a time scale longer than ITER. What I wanted to do in the last few minutes is talk about, well, what would be the implication of when fusion power is realised? I'm an optimist. Um, to a degree, because this field has a long history, you need to be an optimist in this field. But I mentioned at the very beginning of these two lectures that on Earth, fusion could provide essentially limitless fuel available everywhere no greenhouse gases, it's intrinsically safe, doesn't produce long-lived radioactive waste, and is suitable for large-scale energy production. But if I ask the question more generally, what could ubiquitous near-limitless clean energy do? Well, the first thing it could do is it could lift the developing world out of poverty. Much of the developing world is in a state of poverty because it has limitation to, to energy. There's a well-known correlation between standard living and energy supply, particularly electricity supply. It could end energy wars. Most of the wars that are fought around the world are to do with access to fossil fuels. A lot of them are, do, are to do with because my religion A happens to hate religion B and they're mutually compatible and I want to kill each other. But, uh, but uh, apart from that issue, a lot of it is driven by resource challenges and in particular by energy. It could power large-scale uh, clean water through desalination. Australia has a water problem, and particularly in a place like Adelaide, it now has a 100 gigalitre desalination plant because it's run out of uh, fresh water. That's very energy intensive. Uh, so if I wanted to make clean water available more ubiquitously across Australia, I need to power it somehow. Uh, I need something like Fusion or a giant coal-fired power station to do it. Giant coal-fired power stations produce a lot of CO2. What else could I do? Well, we've collectively screwed up the planet by pumping all of the CO2 into it. We could remove it. It sounds far-fetched and crazy, but you could do it. You could build filters that remove all the crap that we've put collectively into the atmosphere over the last two years if you had enough power. So you could build a large-scale uh, fil filtration system that pulls the CO2 out of the atmosphere. You could also build a lot more, uh, plant a lot more trees, and that will work as well, but you need everything in combination. And you know, I'm a bit of a Trekkie. Uh, I love uh, Star Trek. But if you ask the question, let's suppose I want to get to another solar system. How am I going to do it? I certainly can't power it by uh, solar power. Forget that. You look up at the night sky and see a point light in the sky and say, could I power my spacecraft by putting a bunch of solar panels and power it by the night sky? Forget it. You're dreaming. There's no power coming from that. Look, the, look at the night sky and see how much light you have from it and ask the question, could that drive a, power, a, a, um, a solar, a, a space shuttle? And the answer is, forget it. It's not going to happen. If I want to get to another solar system, the only way I can do it 
is via a fusion power based system. Because there is no other energy source that's going to be able to power it to get from A to B. So if, I want to, if I'm a Trekkie and I really want to get from another space uh, to another uh, solar system, there's no other choice. I have to do it. I have to make this, this technology work. Curiously, I was Googling last night, just randomly searching through pictures to see what could I find of a fusion power plant. I know lots of designs that come out of various research organizations, but I came across this, which is kind of fun. This comes from SimCity. And you can find little things that you can construct a power plant, which is, uh, and I, I don't know what the energy cost of these things are, but you can find such things in SimCity, a, a simulation uh, game, basically, <laughs> for growing cities. And uh, here's one artist's rendition of what such a thing would look like. There are lots of different renditions. Um, who knows what it would look like. Uh, but uh, ultimately, these are the type of, the, the combination of fascinating science and also these altruistic drivers is what, is what drives me uh, to engage in fusion science. And I, I'm hoping I've at least given you some of a flavour of that excitement. I've given you a flavour of the complexity. I'm hoping that flavour of complexity is not too much. But I wanted to try and impart you with a, a reason of why I research this field and what's in it for me. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it there.